Uh, so good evening and welcome to tonight's installment of the 2021 WGA online reading series featuring Calgary fiction writer Sophie Stocking reading from her second book, a collection of short fiction entitled Walking Leonard and Other Stories, published by Guernica Editions this spring. My name is Laurie Hamill. I am also a Calgary fiction writer and I'll be hosting tonight's event. We'll begin with Sophie reading the title story from Walking <coughs> Leonard, followed by a discussion between the two of us, and then we'll open the floor to your questions and comments. If you would like to comment or ask a question, uh, you'll need to sign in to YouTube in order to be able to do that. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to thank all of you out there for coming tonight. I would also like to thank the Writers Guild of Alberta for putting on, uh, putting together, sorry, this online reading series. Don't forget to check out uh, WGA's YouTube channel if you uh, would like to see more readings by Alberta authors like the one we're doing tonight. And now uh, let me introduce Sophie. Sophie Stocking can often be found digging in her garden, driving her children around, cooking or walking her two bad dogs. When not juggling all the details typical of a human life in the quiet space of early morning or while waiting in the car or when her family goes fishing, she writes. Her debut novel, Corridor 9, was published by Thistledown Press in 2019 and her story collection, Walking Leonard, was published by Guernica Editions in the spring of 2021. Please join me in welcoming Sophie Stocking. Take it away, Sophie. Um, I will read you uh, the title story, Walking Leonard. It's not the first story. Um, it's about, um, it's set in um, a big empty lot of land. Some, some of the wild spaces in Calgary that I'm always fighting to try to not have developed, but they always get developed. Anyhow, we've lost that one too. So I'm, I'm kind of happy that I, I put it into a story. Um, it was a piece of land when you're heading out of town um, towards Banff, um, beside, beside the Green uh, Wood Village trailer park and, and the highway, and just outside of, just on the edge of Bonaf. Um, so it's called Walking Leonard. And it's quite long, so I hope you guys are ready for that. I walk Leonard in the derelict land between the highway and the trailer park. Paths run here through groves of aspen and scrub cottonwood, curving down coolies and around cattail sloughs, through high tawny grasses and silver sage. I strip the bobbly flowers off the sage and rub them into my palms, breathe in the scent and run it through my hair. In the 80s, they tried to develop this land. They brought in bulldozers and backhoes and tore up the prairie by its roots. But seeds and shoots can't be so dissuaded and the native plants came back. They hold their own now against the thistles and the dandelions. Today in September, goldenrod and purple asters bloom again in something approaching abundance. In the center of this wasteland, you stumble on what looks like the set for a Mad Max movie. It's an old construction waste dump, twisted rebar, broken slabs of concrete and sections of sewer pipe. I can almost stand up in. But even here, the poplar seed seedlings and the yellow clematis insinuate and interlace, and the bulldozers never could touch the space in the wasteland, so vast or the light. The wind shakes the trees and turns them to silver in the sun. It swirls up and out all the way to the blue Rocky Mountain horizon. I shouldn't walk here. My parents worry about crackheads and transients off the highways, biker guys from the trailer park, and coyotes. Supposedly, they've eaten a few peekaboos. There is a story of a trailer park dog that took himself for a walk in January. A winter famished coyote, tired of filling up on freeze-dried rose hips, stalked him through the scrub. The dog hightailed it for home, the coyote behind him all the way, heading for the chain link fence beside the trailer park road. The dog just reached the gate when the driver of the number 40 saw him. The bus slowed down, the driver opened the door, and the dog jumped in. He rode away laughing, leaving the coyote behind on the frozen road in a cloud of diesel exhaust. That is the sort of thing that can happen up here in the wasteland. This is the place where I met the man I called Jesus. Leonard is a Weimaraner. He has a coat like gray silk. He is long and aristocrat aristocratic and neurotic as hell. My mother Celine bought him from a breeder in the States because his father won some Weimaraner championship and she wanted to best her sister Cecile. 
Cecile bought a purebred standard poodle from a local breeder. My mother comes from a family of four sisters, and although they're nearly 60, they still remember exactly who stole whose boyfriend, who got the highest marks in every grade, who won some puppet making contest, and who only got third. If you put those four in a room together, you can cut the air with a knife. On Saturday, my mother kind of vibrates butter onto toast as we discuss my various options for university. In September, I'll start grade 12, so I need to apply to universities now. Leonard lies on my feet, also vibrating. He can't help it, he always does. It keeps my feet warm, but the nervous tick under my left eyebrow starts up and marks time with the kitchen clock. Clarice, she says, your grade point average is 98% in an international baccalaureate program while making provincials with your swimming. Don't forget, your IQ came in at 135. You'll need a copy of the psychologist's academic assessment. Oh, and include your volunteer work at the women's shelter and all your coaching and the City Youth Commission on inclusivity. Oh yes, and don't forget the young Canadians. You are not buffing the glasses as she takes them from the dishwasher. You are not applying to UBC or Nova Scotia Tech for the love of God. But UBC is well respected and the botany department's actually, my father comes into the kitchen in his running gear. He trains for a marathon every year. This time he's doing the ING New York City Marathon in November. Botany, good God, Harold, botany? Your mother's right, buddy. He punches me gently on the shoulder. Don't sell yourself short. Who's my little shooting star? By the way, I'm going to drop in at the hospital after my run. He kisses my mother on the cheek. My father heads up in turtle medicine at the Foothills Hospital, which means I mainly see him running out the door. Don't forget dinner tonight with the berries at the club, my mother says. They said 7.30, and then she turns to me. Will you come? Peter will be there. The berries have a son called Peter. At a swim club end of season party, after my first ever martini, I ended up kissing Peter in the walk-in fridge of the Sheraton banquet room. I am unclear how this came about. Peter wants to be a litigation lawyer. He won at nationals in the butterfly last year and loves to golf. He leaves for Harvard in September. He looks so good in the fridge that night, I'm ashamed to admit, purely due to a certain silky turgidity. Peter is the closest thing to a walking, talking penis you'll ever meet. Tonight, I would rather saw off my leg than go face to face with Peter and his parents at the winter club. No, uh, I mean, I've got to work on these applications. I'll take Leonard out for a walk, but not in that dangerous field, she says to my dad, who's mixing protein powder into a glass of orange juice. If we still lived in Oakville, I wouldn't have to worry about her. She could just go to River Park. And it drives me how Cecile says, bone ass. How does she say bone ass? I don't know, there's an undertone just because she lives in Rideau Park. My father knocks back the orange juice slurry. This is a $2 million home on the Bow River Saline and I can run to work. Cecile can think what she likes. I'll just take Leonard to Beaumont Park and throw the ball for him. There's always tons of people there. My mother holds onto the counter doing alternating sets of leg lifts and calf raises. Not till you get your applications done, Clary. I absolutely insist on Harvard and Brandeis at a bare minimum. Oh, I'm going to Lulu today. Why don't I pick you up a few new hoodies? But my old ones just got comfortable. They're starting to pill. You look scruffy. Okay, I say. I don't think I've ever worn out a piece of clothing or had a favorite old anything. My walk-in closet looks like a boutique. All the clothes arranged in graduated color, precision folded and stacked in pursuit of my mother's when I'm swimming or volunteering or at school. In June, during exam week, I go up to the field on a Friday. Around two in the afternoon on a hot steel day, just the buzz of insects and the distant drone of the highway. If you're up there before supper on weekdays or mornings on weekends, lots of people from the trailer park walk their dogs. The funny thing is the conversations, just polite dog parkies with a few more pit bulls thrown in. We talk about breeds and dog names and health issues, there's a protocol to it. Who knows what people are going through in their personal lives? You all smile at each other and talk about hip dysplasia. You could have the same conversation in any off-leash in the city, even Rideau Park. But up here at two in the afternoon on a weekday, I own the place. I like to walk alone. Not because of Leonard, of course. If anything happened, I'd have to rescue him, not the other way around. But I'm at one with the wind and the light and the plants up here. I'm like a rabbit, good at camouflage. I follow the path down the hill through some willow. We circle around the bottom slough and I try to get Leonard to retrieve a stick from the water. 
but he doesn't like to get his feet wet. We follow the path parallel to the highway, then up and around through another rise to the top where the path cuts through a field of chest high waving grass and wild roses. And then at the Mad Max dumping ground, a man steps out between two piles of scrap concrete. I jump. His long hair falls to his waist, gray and brown and verging on dreadlocks. He looks like Jesus after way too much sun exposure on the cross. I'm annoyed at my heart, whackety whacking under my collarbones. Leonard vibrates against my leg and then he pees on my left runner. Hi, the man says. Six dogs emerge from the scrap concrete behind him. A small husky darts and bashes at Leonard. Leonard never plays with anyone, but to my amazement, he starts chasing the husky in ever widening circles. Jesus says, Lucy still needs lots of exercise. She's a husky? No, a Samoid, the runt. I stand still and wait for the man to pick a path, but he seems in no hurry. He just stands there watching the dogs. Can I walk with you? I need to tire Lucy out and she doesn't play so much with my old dogs. Uh, okay, I'm heading back to the car. I rotate on my heel. No way in hell I'll take the isolated loop that runs beside the Douglas firs. We start walking. From the corner of my eye, I watch his spattered work boots and canvas overalls. He looks wiry and ripped under his clothes and I can't decide on his age by his worn out face. Quiet settles around us, not a breath of wind. He tells me the names of the other five dogs. A stumpy black lab cross with a lot of fatty girls under his skin. Her name is Trouble and she's nine. Jesse, his overweight, gray muzzled golden retriever walks by his knee. Then there's a Samoyed Lucy and three other little nondescript mongrels, Jesus and half a dozen disciples. Jesse's 12 now. I take him to all my jobs with me. The people always love him. The last house I did, the family really liked him. They tried to buy him for 300 bucks, but I need his company. What do you do? I'm a framer. He walks too slowly. So where the path narrows, I go in front to set the pace. In the field with the roses, we can walk abreast again. And he slows right back down. He talks about coyotes. I've never run into one, I say, but I've heard stories. Oh, they're here all right. A big gal's got a den in the bush near my place. He points and I squint at the far edge of the trailer park. I've seen her sniffing around. She can smell the meat. The meat? Yeah, I like to feed them a raw meat diet. It keeps them fit. I buy it bulk and keep it in my freezer. I chop it up with an ax on a block in the yard. So that's what the coyote gal's smelling. Oh, I study the not so fit dogs milling through the grass ahead of us. Some people put out poison bait for them, but what if my dog gets into it, eh? Well, I never thought of that. Do you mean it's up here? Leonard stays pretty close, but he'll eat anything. Well, that was some years ago. I just chase him off with my bike personally. It works pretty good. Really? Yeah, you don't want coyotes getting too friendly. No, I guess not. We come to the eight foot chain link fence, the tiny trailer, trailer yards back onto it. And one of them is his. He's cut a gate into the chain link and built a bench that sits on the wild side. I remember seeing him now sitting there in the evening drinking a beer. This is my favorite place for a beer, he says. He opens the gate to go in and that idiot Leonard dashes ahead of him and starts running loops with Lucy around the backyard. Leonard, come back here. He smells the meat. Jesus tips his chin towards the stump with its embedded ax. You can just come in and grab him if you want. I smile, but I don't move. Eventually he herds him out and I grab him by the collar. Thanks a lot, Leonard, I hiss, and we head for the car. What do you think, Harold? We're sitting down for Cecile's prescribed Sunday togetherness dinner. Tonight, rack of lamb, green beans, and potatoes, Anna. Peaches with kirsch and creme fraiche for dessert. Well, I can't see straight sciences, Clary. Certainly not botany. What would you do with botany? Dentistry, I guess, at the very least. Law, medicine, of course. Engineering leaves me a little cold, but you do excel at math. But I take architecture over engineering. Engineering's almost a trade, but architecture is a profession. I twist my hair around my finger and study it. The chlorines turned it faintly green, despite the special swimmer's shampoo that I use. I don't care what she takes, as long as she gets into a decent university, my mother says, you are world-class, Clary, remember that. But what if I don't do either? I hear my voice coming out of my mouth and it sounds like someone else's. What do you mean, my father says, not medicine or law? Leonard and I escaped to the wasteland after dinner. It's the last week in July. The blue flax and the wild roses and vetch are done blooming now, and it's more galliardia and yarrow. We start walking west down the chain link fence that divides the field from the trailer park, 
I take a trail to the right that heads down a bluff to the field closer to the highway. As we're trudging west of the dirt track where it curves up again, Leonard starts skittering around, making sudden dashes away from me, and then he hides behind my leg and barks. He does this three times. I scan the bushes and tall grass to figure out why he's freaking out, and then I see her, just her mask, the buff-colored snout and the big alert ears, the yellow eyes beautifully outlined in black. She's crouched, peering down at the very edge of the slope above us, the setting sun outlining her fur from behind. Then she starts to do this silk slinky stalk through the scrub coming slowly down the bank towards us. Holy shit, I breathe, and I feel for Leonard's collar. My arm flails around. Of course, no Leonard, who's dancing around like an idiot, and the coyote keeps slowly descending. Don't freak, I tell myself. A coyote won't attack a dog with its owner right there. I stand up as tall as I can, and I hold my hoodie out to each side to make myself look big, bigger. I stomp the ground, and I pretend to go at her. Hey, I shout, making my voice as deep as I can. You get away, you big old gal coyote. We don't want to play with you. Hey, you get away. Leonard is making nervous chihuahua yelps that don't exactly help, but she stops stalk stalking and heads back up the bluff. I let out my breath and feel the adrenaline buzzing through me, but we're not done. At the crest of the hill, she turns and in the light of the setting sun, puffs herself up in all her grandeur. And then she starts to yip and yowl and doesn't Leonard start talking back. I can't take my eyes off of her as I lunge for his collar again. She does a chittery series of yips, looks at Leonard with her pretty eyes over her fluffy illuminated shoulder and he takes off after her up the hill. Leonard, you idiot, I shout. I can't follow him up the bank. It's all wild rose scrub and I'm just wearing flip flops. They disappear over the crest. I run as fast as I can up the dusty road, yelling his name all the way. At the top of the hill, I see the coyote loping full out, Leonard behind and gaining. They run towards the slough to the east. God damn it, Leonard, I shout. And then coming down the road from the west, I see Jesus on his bike, his hair flying behind him in the wind. I keep running as hard as I can. I'll chase her off, he shouts, turning hard off the trail. He bounces over the rough ground and veers up the far side of the pond. The coyote and Leonard run full out to the, up the near side. By now, I'm standing on the bank and calculating the angles. If I swim straight across, I can intercept them before Jesus can reach them on his bike. I tear off my per purse and hoodie, kick off my flip-flops and crouch. Take your mark. I rock back 10 degrees and tighten every muscle. The pistol cracks and I explode, kicking as hard as I can with my right leg my toes digging into the mud. I snap tight into a perfect streamline and fly airborne over the cattails and dimpled luminous water. The cold and gush and wash of the entry, the glide, and I'm cutting through the muddy water and the duckweed at a speed surpassing my personal best. In 20 strokes, I reach the other bank, stagger out and fall on top of Leonard just as he dashes past. We're lying there panting. Leonard giving off whimpers of love for the vanishing coyote, and then Jesus's bike screeches and skids sideways beside us. Making sure I've got a good grip on Leonard's collar, I roll over and look up at the fucking dog, I say. He stares at me, his lime brown face with the hair hanging down, and then he says slowly, he always does talk slowly, you sure are a brave one, but I wouldn't do that again. Don't be throwing yourself into that junk-filled slew for some silly dog. Don't know what's in there. I think there's an old car and lots of broken bottles. He trails off. Good swimmer, too. By the time I fill out just the basic information for Harvard, my eye twitches and my head hurts. The application packages for Yale and Brandeis are even longer. I have to get a SAT reasoning test done and two SAT subject tests. I need two teacher evaluation forms filled. I need to submit supplemental material demonstrating any exceptional talents for swimming, I guess. For Harvard last year, out of 34,303 applicants, only 2,076 students made it in. I've worked all afternoon, the west light sliding now across the thick white pile of my bedroom carpet. My parents are out for dinner with the berries again. From under all the others, I pull out the slim UBC application package in its manila envelope. I stare at it and then slide it back into hiding. In the kitchen, I lean against the cold marble counter and eat leftover veal meatloaf and saffron rice. In two more weeks, school starts back. Swim meets and training camps, 
consumed the whole summer except for the two weeks with my aunts and the cousins in Muskoko. It's only one more week till the big swim off. If I made the team and if my times are strong, strong enough, I'll be carded by the government. That's when we'll know if all the money, the endless driving and waiting and cheering, my parents' investment since I was 10 finally pays off. I get Leonard into the older Audi and we drive up to the wasteland. It's almost September. The sun illuminates the yellowing grasses. The rose bushes turn to russet. I breathe in the sage scented air and lift my eyes to a big poplar. It looks like an old galleon in the wind. Towering clipped cream thunderheads pile up to the north. I try to visualize the race as I walk. There are people in the distance with their dogs. I do the bottom loop around the slough and then I do the top loop in the west field. It is cooling off, but I don't want to go home. I pull the thick cuffs of my hoodie over my hands, put up the hood and zip it to my chin. And then I do another loop around the west field. By the time I am on the straightaway back to my car, the wind whips my yoga pants around my legs and my ankles freeze above my runners. I hold onto my hood and then it starts to rain. It doesn't ease into it, just starts pelting me at a 45 degree angle. In a minute, the left side of my body is drenched. I look up and I see someone through the rain wrestling a carpet off the chain link fence and bundling it onto the back porch of a trailer. The rain turns to hail, first the size of peas, then the size of shooter marbles, and it stings when it hits like some sort of barbaric massage in my mother's spa. The person dragging in the carpet runs back out through the gate in the fence and shouts at me, shouts to me, but I can't hear. When I get close, whoever it is takes my arm and turns me. I look from beneath the dripping hood hanging over my face and realize it's Jesus. You'd better wait it out, he yells. It's gonna be a bad one. Leonard, of course, dashes into the yard past the meat stump and onto a covered porch attached to the short end of the trailer. Jesus opens a door at the side of the trailer and waits for me to go in. The hail pounds down harder now. One like a ping pong ball smashes into my temple and makes my head spin. Leonard makes a dash from the porch to the side door so there's nothing else to do. I cross the yard and I just walk in. I push back my hood and stand there shaking and dripping on a threadbare doormat. When I blink the rain out of my eyelashes, the doormat reads, home sweet home. The dogs all start barking. We've got a visitor, babe, Jesus says when the dogs calm down. This one's pretty brave, but I think she better wait it, wait it out. A woman with long gray hair sits watching a documentary on aliens and crop circles crocheting one of those Barbie doll ballerina toilet roll covers. My second cousin's mother had one centered on her toilet tank. Cecile said it was too tacky for words, but I kind of wanted a matching one. The woman, Babe, is tanned and lean, and I can't tell how old she is either. You're soaked, she says, just a minute, and goes into a back room. I'm going to go change, Jesus says. I stand there dripping with my teeth knocking together. In a minute, Babe comes back and hands me a faded leopard print towel. I take it and rub my hair dry. And then she wraps a polyester pile blanket with two black lab puppies on it around my shoulders. It smells clean and feels really warm. Thank you, I say. Sit here. She smiles and motions to a bar stool beside the kitchen counter. I'll make you hot chocolate. So you're the coyote gal Rob's been talking about. I thought that was almost the end of my dumb dog. If that coyote ate Leonard, my parents would have flipped out. I don't mention they think I shouldn't walk up here. I don't want to be rude. Well, you know what they say about coyote, don't you? No, what? The Navajo called coyote the shapeshifter. When coyote shows up, expect a change, an ending. But that always means a new beginning too. Coyote accompanied the first man and woman into their new life. When one door closes, another door opens, I say, playing along. I notice all the crystals hanging from threads in the little slider kitchen window. An abundant spider plant hangs over the sink in a macrame hammer, a macrame hanger. Yes, like that. Babe boils the kettle and spoons carnation hot chocolate mix out of a jar into mismatched coffee mugs. My mother makes hot chocolate with Dutch processed cocoa, William and Sonoma vanilla paste and organic whole milk. Jesus comes out of the bedroom dressed in sweatpants and an old t-shirt. Let's go sit on the back porch and watch the storm, he says. That's the main reason I built it. He opens the door at the end of the living room and we all step out with our mugs and the dogs. We sit down on an orange plaid sofa. Oh my goodness. And can you hear the sirens? <laughs> um, we sit down on an orange plaid sofa. I sit at the far end, then babe, then Jesus. 
the string, the springs are blown in the seat and it sucks me down. So I'm not sure I can get out without someone hauling me up. But the suctioning sofa makes me feel kind of cocooned. And I snuggle down into the blanket and wrap my hands around my mug. I think of my parents' downfield natural suede sofas from Montauk. You can't sit on them in wet pants. We stare out at the scrub land, at the shifting sheets of hail and rain, at the trees bending and lashing in the wind. Jesus puts his arm around Babe and kisses her on her shiny gray hair. He looks down the couch at me and he lifts his mug. Doesn't get better than this, he yells. And I left, lift my mug back at him. Nothing more needs to be said. And we couldn't say it anyhow over the din. We sit there for probably 15 minutes. I feel the knots in my stomach and shoulders relax. I realize after a while that my eyebrow isn't even twitching. The disciples and Leonard all line up along the edge of the porch, staring into the rain. I drink my cocoa. It is too sweet and watery with a chemical finish, but the heat of it warms me from the roof of my mouth to the bottom of my stomach, and it tastes somehow of freedom. When the storm is over, I thank them, and I have to give them back the black lab puppy blanket. I'm sorry, I say, I got it all wet. Thank you so much. You've been so kind. Thank you for the cocoa and keeping me from getting hailed to death. Babe and Jesus look at me calmly. No worries, Jesus says. Better get home before it's dark, Babe says. She turns to him. The coyote might be out now that the storm's over. Hey, you better follow her on the bike just to be sure. I'll go get my bike out, Jesus says. You get a head start on us, but I'll be around. I want to check out the damage. I wave to the two of them on the porch, and then I latch the gate in the chain link fence behind me. And Leonard and I take off running like crazy through the sideways light catching in the millions of raindrops clinging to branches. As I run, I see myself, the perfect racing dive into the slough, the cattails, the murk, the mud between my toes as they leave the ground, and Jesus saying, don't throw yourself into that junk-filled slough for some silly dog. Who knows what's in there? And the green smell of chlorophyll from the hail mashed plants rises up around Leonard and me. It rises up in cool waves, and we run. That's it. Long. All right. Thank you so much for that great reading, Sophie, uh, in spite of the little interruption we had. Um, I want to talk about a bit about the story, Walking Leonard, um, because I feel like many of the recurring themes we find in the collection come up here. So you have animals, both wild and domestic. Uh, you've got bonus. You've got parent and child relationships. Um, I was wondering if you had a guiding theme or themes in mind when you were writing this story, or did they just sort of come out of it organically as you went along? It was organic. Yeah, very organic, for sure. Yeah. Are those themes that you kind of gravitate to, you know, as a rule of thumb, are those kind of your, your, your key themes or not really? I wonder if I'll always write about bonus. I, um, I, I, don't I hope not I mean I love bonus um so this little community I live in that used to be a small town um that the city's sort of grown to surround um um no I think it just all came out of this is where my life was and I was parenting and um but I, I think what I will carry forward is is this interest in um this the sense of um the fact that we're always immersed in nature um, and we're part of a um, of a biosphere, you know, even if we're living in an urban setting. Um, uh, that so it, you mean uh, everyone or just like people in Bonas? <laughs> everyone, whether they like it or not. Yeah. There, there's been studies, a study I heard about that showed that um, sleep studies of people um, uh, sleeping in basements without windows um, sleep poorly on nights when there's a full moon, even though they can't see there's a full moon. Um, right, because they know at some level that it's happening. Yeah, at some level, yeah. And uh, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I lived in Southern Alberta since I was four and um, I'm just very aware of the weather, the light, the plants, the animals. Um, and I can't see separating that I think that infiltrates all of our experiences all the time. And I'd like to try to convey that. And of course, you know, we know how important it is that all of that works. 
uh, especially they, yeah. especially now i think when we're we're all sort of feeling the climate or the effects of climate change uh, yeah. in a more dramatic and sudden way you know than we had anticipated yeah. before right yeah no um well, let's talk a little bit about uh, Bowness because I was struck when I was reading the collection by what a strong presence the community of Bowness is here. Uh, for viewers who may not be familiar with Calgary, Bowness is a community in the northwest area of Calgary that was an independent town until it was annexed by the city in 1964. But as Sophie sort of hints at, uh, Bowness retains its own identity and flavor. Um, can you comment on the role that Bones has in your book? As I don't, I just um, I'm rooted here, you know. Um, I, it's a it's an interesting place. There's um, a lot of history here. Geographically, I think it's quite interesting. It's an island. We found out in the flood of 2013 that we basically were an island because um, all the bridges were unstable and we couldn't leave. Um, it's and wasn't that partly why Hextall chose that location? Hextall was one of the founders of Bonus because yeah. it was isolated. Um, I, Hextall was a rancher, and he um, Bonus Park was his cow pasture, yeah. and he um, decided he turned it into a park, and he built the Hextall Bridge, a steel span um, bridge. Um, out of his own pocket in exchange for the city of Calgary sending a um, 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 little railway line um, to connect, a tram line to connect the city to the park. Um, and so, yeah, Bones has always had um, this um, aura of being a place to get away, um, especially at that time, it was a holiday place and there were all sorts of funny uh, little resort like places here, like they had names like Shangri-La and the Romeo and Juliet Inn and Happy Valley and um, Bonus Park, of course, had, you know, rides and um, swimming and skating and um, right. I mean, so it was from a, people from Calgary would, you know, have like a vacation Hawaii. in Bonus, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, and it, but it was also a place to put things that you didn't want. And so um, they put um, the TB sanatorium there. They put um, right. um, Woods Christian Home for naughty kids. You know, yeah. and to this day, there's that there's the same kind of duality of um, you know really wealthy homes along the perimeter, and then um, subsidized housing, and, and there's a lot of, of grit in Bones. Um, there's a lot of nature and parks and uh, the river. Um, so it's it's just a I think there's just a lot of stories here. I guess that's it. And I think you do a great job of sort of bringing all those disparate elements in the community into your collection. Um, you know, in a way, I, I feel like Bones is almost a character in this in this book. Oh, cool. That's it, neat. You did, it's, it's really cool the way you did that. Um, so this is your second book. Um, you launched your first book, uh, the novel Corridor 9, uh, in 2019 in yeah. pre-pandemic times. Uh, Walking Leonard is now being launched at what is hopefully the tail end of the pandemic. What are your thoughts on launching a book during a pandemic versus not a pandemic? It was kind of lonelier, you know, the launch, I couldn't see anybody. It was virtual. It was, it was just kind of odd. Um, it was, it was lower stress, but um, it was so wonderful to have. I had a, um, a great launch for the first one in the basement of a church and um, I had a blues guitarist and it was fun. And, yeah, it's too bad, but um, my next time. yeah, next time. And my publisher was fantastic, and um, they they do this launch for you, which is they organize it, so it was less stress, I guess. Yeah, but the food wasn't as good, so <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Um, you know, maybe at this time, we I see you we're at seven thirty eight here. Um, I'm going to just check in with the audience and see if anyone has any questions. Uh, Jason can uh, transmit them via chat to us if you do have any questions. If not, you're going to have to ask me more questions. If not, yeah, I guess I will. Nothing yet. Okay, so I got one more question for you. Well, I have a few more, but we'll start with this one. 
what's next for Sophie Stocking? It sounds to me like you are working on some more stuff. So can you share with us what it is you're working on? Um, I'm working on a novel. I've been working on a novel for like three years and I have to finish it by the end of August or I'll, I'll give up on myself. So, um, Oh, don't do that. <laughs> it's a, it's a novel about a housewife's midlife crisis um, uh, in which she encounters um, uh, um, an alternate self who um, she could have been if she'd made a different choice. Um, my first novel had a, um, a fantasy element, strong fantasy element mixed in with the literary fiction. And this one does as well. I don't seem to be able to get away from that. I really have fun with that. So it's, it's not a bad thing, Sophie. Uh, a lot of people do it to, with, with great success. I so guess. that's, that's, is that all you're working on? Do you have, you know, something else? Um, I have another story that I started two years before that. Um, and then I abandoned it. Um, because of, you know, issues with cultural appropriation and everything was so unnerving at that time. Um, and I had a indigenous character as one of the characters and I was right in her head and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking I might come back to it, but right from outside of her head. Um, that might be easier. Yeah. I, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm going to take a break and do this, um, this children's book that I've written and, and I'm, attempting to be an illustrator. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to work on that for a few months and then, then I'll see what I want to do. I think after that. That sounds good. Yeah. Well, maybe we have time for one more question from me. And my question is, do you have any advice for the writers out in the audience? Ah, I read something just before this started and I thought it was hilarious. It said, and I agree, everything that needs to be said has already been said. But since no one was listening, everything must be said again. Andre, yeah, Andre Guide. <laughs> I was going to say that sounds like a mother, but okay, maybe, you know, could be from a father too. The experience of giving advice and not being listened to. Right? Who, who remembers those old stories? Anyhow. Well, yeah. I so don't feel like you're just saying something that, that someone else said is still important. Um, what other advice? Um, I would say read a great deal, but then stop reading for a while and just write. I, I sort of believe in reading at different stages in your life and then letting it all sort of ferment and putting it away and then writing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what, about, what about reading other stuff than what you're writing? Like, do you read novels when you're writing a novel or no? No, no, no. no. Yeah, I find I'm my life's... A, so crazy if I'm writing, I don't have time to read. So it's not a problem, but <laughs> sadly. You've got a lot of other things to occupy you. Yes, yes, I do. What else? Any other, any other advice for the writers out in the audience? Um, just refuse to give up on your story. Just um, like, even if you're, I'm, I'm terrible. I, I was in a um, Humber School for Writing workshop last week and we were talking about our writing process and I felt awful because everybody in the group um, has really sticks to a schedule and, and does a good job at it. And I'm, I'm, I'm dreadful. I, I write in fits and spurts and in the car while I'm waiting for my kids or, you know, all sorts of funny places. And um, I'm very erratic, but though I, I do manage to produce books and it's just because I sort of refuse to give up, you know, on them. I, for Maybe those other people weren't exactly telling the truth. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. But yeah, I'm sure lots of people are better at discipline and schedule than I am. I really, did, you know, I resist uh, schedule. So. <laughs> but I, you know, I think that can be inspiring for the other people that don't necessarily have a schedule. I mean, I think the key is to just come at it regularly and make sure that you know, in a given week or a given month, you do a certain amount of writing, whatever it is. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It doesn't have to be every single day or it doesn't have to be Monday to Friday. I mean, it just has to be a regular occurrence for you in some way. 
Yeah. And I am yeah, definitely it is for you. I mean, you've got two published books and you're working on two more. Sounds like productivity is not really a problem for you. Yeah. Yeah. Not bad. It's just the city. It's the starting. The starting is hard and um, really scary somehow. And then once you get started, you don't stop. So it's just making myself start. So, yeah. Well, that sounds like great advice, Sophie. I think that's really good. But yeah. So, yeah. Anything else you'd like to say before we sign off here? No. I think that's good. That's good. Well, thanks so much for the reading. That was great. It was great to hear the story read in the author's voice. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. Thanks again to the Writers Guild of Alberta and Jason for uh, getting this on the road. Thanks so much. Awesome. Thank you for hosting me, Lori. Oh, my pleasure. It was fun. <laughs>